All right. Here, hold on. Yeah, just move that over there. There we go. I just got to. I just got to be able to run my. Yeah. You want to see it? I'll move it out the way. Here, just move that the way. Do I need a microphone? Well, they're recording it, so I probably should have to have the microphone on. Y'all sit down. Is this on or not? You hooked up to them speakers? Is this says it's on or not? Well, it's live. Oh, it is live? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Y'all want to sit down so we can start? That's the mic if they want to speak. This one's live. Okay, good. I'd like to introduce y'all to Danny Garrett. He's going to give a slide presentation of the new district maps. All right. Again, Danny Garrett. Um, some of you know, um, do legal work for the parish. For this purposes, I'm actually contracted with a group called Strategic Demographics, LLC. It's a company owned by a guy by the name of Dr. Bill Blair. Uh, Bill, Bill is a state demographer. He does this on the side for local governments. Uh, Bill and I worked together 10 years ago. We, were, we actually worked together at the legislature many moons ago, uh, but we worked redistricting together 10 years ago, and in this cycle we hooked back up again, and we're doing a number of local governments around the state. So this is kind of an informational presentation just so the public can see kind of what the process is, what the timeline is, what we can and can't do. Because I know a lot of people think it's, whole lot, it's easier than it really is where we'll just draw that line right there. You can't necessarily do that. So what are the steps? First of all, you conduct the census in 2020. Second, you determine if, you are, if, you have a, if you're in a circumstance of malapportionment. If you are, then you have to start drawing plans. Then you have to introduce one of the plan, one or more of the plans that are drawn. You then adopt that plan. If you're the school board, it'd be by resolution. If you're the parish, it's by ordinance. Then after you've adopted them, they have to be submitted to the Secretary of State. One of, that's crucial because you have to make sure they're, they're comply with various state laws or the Secretary of State will kick them back. And then after that takes place, the Secretary of State will use those new districts to run your elections this fall. Doesn't change where anybody represents today. It's just those are the districts that you will run in the fall. So that's kind of the, the process. Now, census, the basics of the census is they try to do a count every 10 years. They start in late year, ends with a nine. This time it was 2019. They finish in mid-2020. Officially, census day is April 1 of, of the year with a 10 in it, right? 2000, 2010, 2020. The census data is then presented to the president by the Census Bureau. Now, ordinarily, that happens before the end of the census year. In other words, before the end of 2020, ordinarily, the census data would have been submitted to the president. That did not happen. The Census Bureau did not present the census data to President Trump prior to him leaving office after the election. In fact, they did not present the census data to a president until President Biden, and that was in April, on April 1, of uh, 2021. Now, normally, it would have been presented in 2020, at the end of 2020, it would then have been released before April of 2021. But that didn't happen this time. So the purpose of the census primarily under the Constitution is to provide for the reapportionment of Congress, to figure out how they're gonna divide up those 435 congressional seats. And a lot of you, they, you know, you, the census data was actually released on a state basis before we got the local data that we can use to draw the districts here. The, um, so that's how everybody knew that Louisiana didn't lose a congressman this time. Okay, if you've been around following this a couple of cycles ago, Louisiana did lose a congressman. A couple of cycles before that, we also lost a congressman. This cycle, for the first time in history, California actually lost two seats in Congress. Um, but places like Texas and Florida and Georgia because they had population increase relative. And, and people forget it's not just whether you had pro population increase or decrease, it's what is your population relative to the population across the country. It, you could, we had an increased population in the state of Louisiana, just not as much as other states, so we didn't pick up a new congressman. So, like I said, normally the data would have been given to the president at the end of 2020. We would have gotten it in late February, early March of 2021. We did not get the data that was submitted to the president in April 21 
until September of 2021. So it's kind of compressed the time frame that y'all have. Now y'all are a somewhat unique parish in the sense that your school board runs on the ordinary school board cycle, which is the fall of 22 is when their next election is. Your parish government by your home rule charter also runs on that same cycle. Most parishes will not run until 23 with the legislature. All right, so the first thing we had to do is we had to take the 2020 census data and upload it into your current districts. Those are the districts that y'all passed uh, about 10 years ago and that y'all been running on. So you take those geographic lines, you upload the census data into that map and you determine whether or not your districts are uh, malapportioned. The whole point of district sizes is one person, one vote. The idea being each district should be approximately the same size. The way I explain it is this. If you have 10,000 people in District A and they have one member on the school board or on the council, and you got 5,000 people in District B and they also have one member on the school board. Well, that means that these 5,000 people essentially have twice the voting power on the council of the school board because it's half the number of people, but they get the exact same number of representation. So you try to get that as close as, as you can. The, the leeway is plus or minus 5% of what's called the ideal district. The ideal district is just the total population divided by the number of districts. So as long as your districts are win plus, within plus or minus 5%, you're close enough that you're considered to be not malapportioned. But if you are malapportioned, that means you have to go draw your change it, your district lines to change it because you're no long, you now have a constitutional problem of, of, of violating that one vote, one man, one vote principle. So this, there we go. Now, this is, these are the districts as they currently exist. So these are the districts that we utilized to, to upload that, those numbers. This was the base malapportionment report. You see that column with the percentages? That is the percentage off of the ideal. You had the parish population was 23,515 divided by nine. Your ideal district is 2,613. So that is the percentages plus or minus that the districts were off of that ideal. So clearly you were malapportioned. Now that's not necessarily where, that's not the end of the discussion. We had to adjust your base because when you have a prison that houses uh, inmates who are sentenced to felony convictions and are constitutionally prohibited in the state of Louisiana from voting in either a council election or a school board election, you have to look at whether or not that number is high enough to skew these percentages. In this case, y'all had 468 inmates at the detention center over there on the East Bank. Now, 468 off of about 2,600, that's almost, what, a little less than 20% of a district would have been sitting over there at the detention facility, constitutionally prohibited from participating in the election process. So that can, that can skew the results so that if you, you, if you kept those people and you kept that number in that district, that district would actually effectively have more voting power because a big chunk of that district, remember we're working off that plus or minus 5%, a big chunk of that district would actually ha result in uh, it, it, it being overly represented. The better example, the most stark example we have in the state is West Feliciana Parish, which I actually happen to be the parish attorney in. In West Feliciana Parish, you're probably all familiar, there's Angola State Penitentiary, right? The population by census of St. West Louisiana Parish is about 20,000 people, but 5,000 about are involuntary guests of the state at Angola State Penitentiary. They have four single member districts and an at-large in West Louisiana. So if you had four districts divided by 20, well, that's 5,000. That means an entire district would be Angola State Penitentiary. It might be very easy to campaign there, but it would really skew the results. And actually, I think the technical population in Angola on census day this time was 4,800. So basically, you'd have 200 people who could actually vote for that council member. So 200 people would elect a member of the district council, and the other council members would have 5,000 people in their districts. That's why you have to take a look. In some jurisdictions, it doesn't matter. For example, 10 years ago, I worked on the city of New Orleans as redistricting. A council district at that time in the city of New Orleans was about 60,000 people. 1,000 inmates at the Orleans Parish Jail, 1,500 inmates at the Orleans Parish Jail. 
was statistically irrelevant in a district that had 60,000 people in it. So there's no reason to redact them out. But in y'all's case, we needed to. So when you redact them out, it actually made District 1 deviation even worse than it appeared initially. Because if you redact them out, it lowers the ideal, because you take that number out of the total, you then do the math again, divided by nine, lowers the ideal, so the population of District 1 was 1,890, but that included those 468 people. When you take them out, it lowers their adjusted population only to 1,422, which means they were 44% below the ideal on the East Bank. Now, when you start drawing plans, there's a couple of different ways that consultants do it. Some consultants say, look, let me just do it. I know what's best. I'll draw it. Um, that's not the way we've approached it. We actually meet with individual members either one-on-one -on -one or in little groups of two or three, always conscious of the open meetings law. But the reason we do it like that is because y'all know way more about your communities than we do. Y'all know better than we do whether if you have to lose population, which population makes the most sense for the core of your district. Or if you have to add population and you can add it west or east or north or south, you'll have a better idea of which of those communities makes sense together. And, and, and also, you'll also have an idea of where growth is going, so you can also kind of direct where maybe you need to draw districts smaller for the future. Um, the members work with the demographer. We are really the tool, we're the technical side of it. We have very good mapping software that helps us, and we can look at all kinds of permutations. Ultimately, in representative democracy, which is what we have, y'all are elected in part to make this decision. The council, part of its charge under the charter is to adopt the ordinance setting the districts after each census. School board has a statutory obligation to adopt a plan to comply with the one man, one vote principles. So ultimately y'all are the ones that are gonna have to vote for it. Now certainly, just like fence like this, you try to get input from your constituents. You get input from people in your area of what they think it ought to do, but subject to the rules that we have, and we'll get to those in a second. So, drawing plans. First of all, you try to get the populations within that plus or minus 5%. Secondly, the statute requires that you use whole precincts to the best available. Now, the precincts were ultimately created by the council before the end of 2019. Those were locked in place under state law. The census uses those precincts to draw what are called census blocks within them, and that's how they populate it with the census population. Also, those districts are locked because the legislature is going to be using them starting February 1st, drawing legislative districts, Supreme Court districts, congressional districts. So you can't really re-envision those precincts. Now in most places, the school board is doing this and the parish is not running until next year, so the school board can split a precinct and have part of the precinct be in one district and part of the precinct be in another district, but they can only split it once and they can't have more than three split precincts in a district. When, a, when the parish, because the parish can, does have a, a special provision of law, it can divide precincts. So let's say you have district five, precinct five, and it's this. The parish can actually create precinct 5A and precinct 5B as long as they keep the exterior of the whole thing the same. That way the legislature can just use both of them as, as they would have used one. Now the benefits y'all have is that if y'all go with what you've done historically, and that is you would, the school board and the parish decide to adopt the same plan, the parish can actually adopt the precinct divisions that are necessary to accomplish the plan, and then the school board's plan is using those whole precincts after the division has taken place, which the registrar of voter likes, because the registrar of voter hates split precincts, because split precincts mean they have to have people come in and they have to look at their last name and determine do you have to vote at that voting machine or that voting machine because you, if you have precinct five but it's split for a school district, some of you are gonna vote one on one ballot and some of you are on the other because you're in two separate school board districts. Y'all kind of had the benefit and that's because primarily because of the home rule charter which has the parish having its districts being, uh, or its elections on the school board cycle. Now, um, Again, one of the things you do try to do is you also try to uh, keep communities of interest together. That's like, look, if you can keep from separating, y'all don't have any incorporated municipalities, but you still have communities. 
and you still have neighborhoods. Now, it's not always possible. You're always going to have circumstances where the way it is is the way it is. And part of that is because of something called census blocks. And we'll get to that in a second, but census blocks are these imaginary lines basically drawn by the Census Bureau, which is how they populate the data. They don't do it by whole precinct. They do it by census block. Census blocks, there's two types. There's those that follow a visible feature like a road or a stream or a canal or a pipeline. And there are others that are just random. They just decided to make it there for whatever reason. And some of them can be so bizarre. Those of you that have, that have looked at, at us while we're working have seen that there are some census blocks. You say it would make a whole lot more simple if we could just draw the line right here. Problem is that splits a census block, which is something you cannot do because we don't have any way of knowing how many people live in this part of that census block or how many people live in that part of that census block. Um, another thing you have to be careful of when you're doing your redistricting is the Voting Rights Act. And there's really two pieces to that. First of all is retrogression. Retrogression is a provision that essentially states you cannot do anything to impair existing minority voting strength. Now, it used to be after you adopted your plans, we would submit those to the United States Department of Justice and they would review them as to whether or not they were compliant. Supreme Court decision in 2013 basically said there, the provision of the Voting Rights Act that had the list of the jurisdictions that had to do that, and Louisiana was on that list, that because Congress had not gone back and reviewed that list the last time they renewed the Voting Rights Act, that list became arbitrary, so they basically took everybody off the list. And they've not done anything since 2013 to fix that. So there is no preclearance anymore, which is kind of good in this situation because of that delay in getting the census, because that preclearance can take 60 to 90 days. And that's after you've adopted the plan. So it kind of helped us out a little bit. Now, introduction, let's see. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Whoop. yeah. All right, introductions of plans. So individual, it will take a member of the school board, it will take a member of the council to introduce the plan. School board will be by resolution, council will be by ordinance. You have to, you basically describe each district. Now you'll, in some places, where the districts are larger and have multiple precincts, it's just a list of precincts. In y'all's, it's gonna be more of a, more of a meets and bounds description because y'all have fewer precincts. And some of your districts are actually made up by a single precinct. So the adoption of those resolutions and those ordinances have to take place by your ordinary mechanism. So if they're required to lay over, they're required to lay over. They require a majority vote. The ordinance is gonna require the five votes. It's going to require the five votes. So once you, you know, and, and again, y'all are y'all are kind of doing this together. But again, y'all are not required to. But it's just how historically y'all have. If y'all wanted, if it just couldn't get to a point where we couldn't find a plan that y'all liked, the 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 school board liked, and the council liked, and it's kind of interesting that y'all chose two sides of the room makes it easier. Uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but but nothing would stop the council from having their plan and y'all having your plan. Um, now, when you have historically done it the same, sometimes voters get a little aggravated because voters kind of like to think, I mean, I'm in District 5 or I'm in District 4. They don't, some voters have a problem with being in District 5 in the council and District 4. But again, not everybody does it like that. And y'all are one of the few that have historically done it. If y'all want to keep doing it, that's great. Actually, under our contract, if y'all adopt a single plan, y'all both get a discount. Um, so, uh, Make, so make sure that when you set up these meetings, you make sure you notice them properly. You know, make sure that your agenda lets people know that you're gonna consider adopting that plan. Because just like a regular, regular resolution or a regular ordinance, you have to allow for public comment. Now y'all have set up this process where we're gonna have three town hall meetings. Y'all got some special uh, email addresses that we'll get to later that allow people to submit their comments to let y'all know. Because again, y'all are their elected representatives. Y'all will hear their comments. You will take that information, you will then use it to make the best decision that you can make for the school board or for the council. All right, now, I brought up census blocks. Here are examples of how crazy census blocks can be. This census block, and Trudy is very familiar with this one, it runs all the way, that red is one census block. Now I can tell you in drawing plans, it would have been a whole lot more efficient if we could have figured out a way to draw a line across that, that's 321 people. So that 321 people, again, out of a district that's about a little over 2,500, 
has to be all in one district or all in another district. You can't split it. Up there towards Bell Chase, see that big crazy thing that looks almost like a pistol? 82 people. And I can tell you, it would have been a whole lot simpler to draw plans up in that area if we could have drawn that. And those of you that have been seeing that process have realized, well, can't we just draw that line somewhere? Nope. We have to, that entire census block has to be in a whole district. That's one of the problems you run into, and it's oftentimes it's not something that the, the general public realizes, that y'all do have rules. Y'all do have, that you can't just draw the line where you think it makes sense. You have to accommodate these crazy census blocks. All right, this is a working draft that is in place right now, hasn't been voted on by anybody. It's based upon a, uh, several meetings that I've had with members with council members and school board members in small groups. And what this plan does is it currently meets the base legal criterion. All right. If you'll notice, all of the districts are within that plus or minus five. Now remember, District 1, you account for that 468. So even though it looks like it's too big, once you redact out that 468, its adjusted population falls within that range and it's only 3.5%. So all of them are within plus or minus 5%. Also, it does maintain District 1 and District 7 as majority minority districts, that voting rights issue that we have to take care of. And it, again, we didn't really have to worry about precinct splits so much because we can do the divisions. So this is District 1 under that plan, and really it's not all of it. It's basically the entire East Bank. Plus, remember the East Bank was really, really low in population, particularly after you redacted out the inmates, because that's the little, the little red icon there. That's kind of where the jail is. In order to add population, it was going to have to cross the river. One option is crossing the river right here at the base road and taking in a portion of the base. That adds enough population to District 1 to get it within that acceptable population criterion. District 2, really very little change. Um, this red line is where the district line used to be. Really very little change. They had to make it smaller because it was way over the acceptable. But its, it's general geography is the same. Uh, district 3, again, very similar to what it had been. It did have to contract a little bit. It had to lose a little population, if you'll notice. This was the prior line, so it lost some population here, picked up a little there. District 4, again, it's generally been based right there on the river. That's the general site. If you look at, at the red line, it's about where it was. It did have to make, it had to contract a little bit to account for some other changes. Because again, this puzzle all has to fit together. District 5, pretty significant change to District 5 because it was very large from a population standpoint. And there were also needs south of it that had to come up. District 6, now District 6, I broke it into two parts because District 6 kind of looks like a barbell, but it's historically looked like that. And it's part up there, it then goes down the river and then it connects. You see it connects to another section. And remember that census block I showed you? That census block is right in here. Again, had we, been, had, had we been able to split that census block, we could have made this look different. But that census block runs all the way up to here. And so you either have to put that in a completely another district, and it's 321 people. So it would have radically changed the total population of District 6 if you put that census block anywhere else. This is the northern part of District 7. Again, District 7s tend to be down the river. It's, and, and you had to make sure you maintained it as a minority district. That's the northern portion of it. It then goes down the south. It goes a little bit further south than it used to go, but it had to pick up some population while at the same time still maintaining its status as a majority minority district. Now, District 8 got significantly larger because it was very low in population. And interestingly enough, so was District 9. Well, District 9, can't go into the Gulf of Mexico to pick up population. It can only go north. So it put pressure on eight, which caused pre eight, which was already low, to have to push even further north. It's, it's a significant change from what has been, 
but there's really nowhere else to go. Can't go into Jefferson Parish. Can't really do anything in, to mess up seven. And I'll show you as a moment, can't really go south. There's really nowhere else to go but this way. And this is the southern part of the district of eight. It goes all the way down. And notice down to purple, there's District 9. So we went ahead and crossed the river at District 9. It really is not much population here. Just so one didn't go all the way down as far as here, it stops one here in District 8, essentially. And that's where we are right now, right there in Beerus. The, it just goes to show from a, pop, a, a geogra geographic standpoint, District 9 is huge. District 1 is huge geographically. That's because the population densities in those areas are so much lower than, say, where District 3 is located right there in Belchase. It's a much more dense population, so the geography is much smaller. Now, adoption. Again, it's by ordinance or resolution. It's under the same rules as you would ordinarily do which includes public comment at the meeting, which includes the majority vote requirement, you can make minor adjustments on what was introduced. Just like any resolution or ordinance can accept amendments at that time, the only thing you have to avoid is making wholesale changes that make the plan radically different than what was introduced. And it's really more of an issue for uh, the, the, the parish because under the Home Rule Charter, they have to make sure that the ordinance that gets it vote, finally voted on is at least a semblance of what was introduced. You gotta be careful in how much you amend it. But you can make minor adjustments. Um, now, there's a couple of deadlines. Under the Home Rule Charter, the council is required to have their plan adopted at least six months before the next election. So that's May 8th. The school board technically has all the way until June 22nd, 20 at 4.30 p.m., that's a state law provision that says that the Secretary of State will not run an election on a plan that they receive after 4.30 p.m., four weeks from the opening of qualifying. And that's what that date is. So essentially, they'd have to adopt it on the 21st or the day of the 22nd in order to get it to the Secretary of State. It is transmitted electronically, but no one aims for that deadline simply because if you mess up, then, then, then you're, you've committed malfeasance by not adjusting your districts as required. Public input. Um, again, you'll have public input at the meeting where you vote. They're also having three of these town hall meetings, this one here in Buras on the 13th at the council chambers and um, at the, on, on Saturday the 15th in Point Lahash at 11 o'clock. Also, in order to document the comments, there is an email address at PPG, it's PIO at ppgov.net, or the school board, y'all, Sonia set up a special email address just for y'all, and it's ppsbmeetings at ppsb.org, and people can email those, uh, their comments directly to those email addresses. By having set email addresses, it's gonna be easier to keep track of them. And as I appreciate, I'll email this PowerPoint presentation so that it can be put on both the school board's website and the PPGov's website. Also, your constituents can just contact their council member or their school board member directly and say, look, this is what I think ought to happen. This is what I think ought to happen. This is where I think it ought to go. This is how I think we ought to solve that problem. Now, I think the good thing about these town hall meetings, particularly if they go back and watch them, is they'll understand that it's just not, y'all just don't have carte blanche to do whatever you want. You can't just draw those lines wherever you feel like drawing them. There are rules that you have to comply with both constitutional, federal law, and state law rules that you have to comply with. And like I said, the hardest one is not splitting those uh, census blocks. And like I said, for the people who've been drawing them, you can see there's times where it makes total sense. Or, it, or you're, you're like, you know what? We only, if we had 50 more people, it would make this perfect. And you click on that set next census block, and it's 280 people, and it's that big and it blows everything up. Or you click on a census block and it cuts off the district because districts have to be contiguous. Now, a lot of people think you can't have a district that's split by the river, that is untrue. There are many, many election districts in this state that are split by the Mississippi River. Uh, perfect example, a city council district in Orleans, they always have a district split by the river. It's Algiers and the French Quarter, split by the river. And it doesn't matter if there's a bridge, it doesn't matter if there's a ferry, rivers and lakes and other waterways do not interrupt 
the contiguous nature of a district. In fact, we've had state senate districts that were in partially in Metairie and partially in the North Shore. They jumped across Lake Pontchartrain. Um, so you can't, water doesn't, what you can't do is have other geography splitting a district because they have to be contiguous. And again, it seems easy until you start doing it and then it can get a little complicated. But what I've found in my experience is because y'all know more about your individual communities, y'all generally have a better understanding of what works together. And what I, what I do is I try to show you what technically can work. And then y'all get to decide as the elected representatives of the people, which one makes the most sense. So um, as I appreciate the, the meetings are being streamed and they are gonna be recorded for later reviewing. And if there's anybody that has any questions about this, um, we can do it now. Again, just to, to finish up, plan must be adopted into the Secretary of State by 4.30 p.m. on June 22nd. That's four weeks before qualifying. The council has a charter requirement that their plan be adopted by May 8th. We will provide those electronic files to the Secretary of State. Qualifying opens on July 20th. The election's held on November 8th and the runoff on December 10th. So those are the dates that everybody is gonna be living with. And again, uh, Dr. Bill Blair is the sole member. He owns Strategic Demographics. Um, I contract with them to assist. Like I said, Dr. Blair and I work together. Dr. Blair is the state demographer. He's got a PhD in political science. He, uh, he said, this is actually his third uh, redistricting cycle. It is my second. When we worked together on 32 jurisdictions last year, back when we still had to do submissions to the Justice Department, and um, I primarily did those submissions, and every submission I submitted to the Justice Department was pretty clear, and I take a little pride in that. I'm never going to advise you to do something that I think violates one of those criteria, because that's not what you hire a professional for. Now, ultimately, the elected officials make the decision, I do not. But I will tell you if I think that what you're about to do does or does not comply with, the, with one of those criteria. And that's just what I'm here to be, is, is a tool for y'all to accomplish one of the things you were elected to do. So I've kind of gone through this pretty quick to see if there are anybody, any people that have any questions. I know there, so if people come back late, if they wanted to go back and, and look at anything, we can go back and look at it, or I can just answer questions that I didn't cover in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. Abo? Is it online? I think that's what you said, right? um, I'm gonna email this PowerPoint to them so they can put it online at both the school board website and PPGov's website. Yes, sir. Is there the only proposal to be voted on is a nine-member nine-member council? Was anything else uh, suggested to say let's have three districts with two at large, uh, or anything like that? Was well, it, is I, I it always got to be nine members? Well, I'll tell you this. All right, from the council's perspective, the Home Rule Charter requires that the council be made up of not less than nine single member districts. So in order to change that, they can have more, but they cannot have less than nine single member districts. If they were to change that, it would, it would take a charter amendment. I know there was some discussion over the last couple years about submitting a charter amendment to the, but that would have to be adopted by the council, then submitted to the voters and the voters would have to approve it. But that's the council. Now the school board, the only law that governs you with regard to your size is the statutory provision in Title 17 that says a school board can be no fewer than five, no larger than 15. And there are some five member school boards in the state and there are some 15 member school boards in the state and there are a number of them in between. So that's, I hope I've answered your question, but the charter restricts the council to not fewer than nine. So the council could have, they could decide to go to 11 members but they couldn't, or 10 members or 13 members, but they couldn't go below nine. So they wouldn't, under the current charter, they wouldn't have the ability to go to like three districts and two at larges or five districts and two at larges or seven districts and one at large. They couldn't do that without a charter amendment. But they could change. Well, they can't. A charter amendment requires an ordinance be adopted by the council. It calls an election and the voters of Plaquemines Parish would have to vote for that charter amendment before it would take effect. And there's no time to do that between now and the fall elections. 
because there are certain deadlines that you have to meet to put a matter on, the, put a homeowner charter matter on the ballot. And those deadlines are set by the state. Your, your charter is what your charter is. Now the school board has all kind of flexibility. <laughs> oh, there was something I was asked to talk about. It's not a PowerPoint. Thought it might come up. JP and constables. The council does not have the authority to draw justice of the peace or constable districts. Justice of the peace and constable districts are considered quasi-judicial. They are the purview of the state legislature. So, because I know y'all have, uh, have an odd circumstance right now in that y'all have an empty JP and constable seats because there's literally not one registered voter who resides within the ge geographic boundary of that district which means there's literally no one qualified to get elected, nor be appointed by the governor. So uh, that just, I, I was asked to touch on that because a lot of people think that the councils can change that, they can't. That has to be done by the state legislature. That'd be Mac. <laughs> Go talk to Mac. In the, in the back of the room, um, there's some paperwork you can pick up. It explains the, uh, it reiterates the email addresses where you can send your comments. It's on the back table that we don't have to write it down. You can just pick it up on your way out. All right. Else? See, I explained it so well, I hardly have any questions. All right.